Hello, everyone, and welcome to Design in Asia, Iranian Architecture. We're very pleased to welcome you to today's program organized by AIADC's Asian American Designers Union and the Washington Alexandria Architecture Center. Before we get started, we have a quick legal disclaimer. By participating in this webinar, you're granting your permission to be recorded and for the recording to be distributed as AIADC and the Washington Architectural Foundation may choose. We'll have time for Q&A after the presentation. Please enter your questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our moderator and the Asian American Designer Designers Union, Shibei Hong. Shibei? Hello, thank you. Welcome, if you find yourself interested in Iranian architecture, either climate, cities, landscape of culture, uh, you find your material today. Uh, we are ADU, we're a platform for empowering Asian American designer, architects, and engineers since 2018. Um, and we have five fabulous scholars from Virginia Tech today with us. Now let's get started. Erizo. Uh, can you bring us an introduction to the overall Iranian architecture? Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Arizu, and I'm happy to uh, present an introduction to uh, Iranian architecture. Um, for uh, introducing, um, we have to start from historical and geographical uh, context. Uh, located in Western Asia with an area of 636,372 square mile and a, a population of 83, 83 million. Uh, Iran is the uh, second largest country in Middle East and, and with an ethnical variety. Um, established as uh, Persia around 678 BC, um, is home of one of the world's uh, oldest civilization. As you can see uh, in the greater Iran, um, cultural borders of Iran is actually far beyond the current ones. Next, please. Um, at the moment, there are 24 UNESCO, UNESCO World Heritage Sites listed in Iran and many are in waiting list. Uh, this is Chola Zambil. Ziggurat, uh, which is um, an ancient Elamite complex in the Khuzestan um, province of Iran. Uh, it was built around 1250 BC uh, to honor God uh, Ishushidid and uh, lived in by only priests and servants. It was abandoned around 640 BC. Next, please. Uh, Persepolis or Tahta Jam Jamshid uh, is another World Heritage site and was an um, Achaemenid uh, Empire capital established around 550 BC. Uh, it is a walled uh, platform uh, with five different palaces and it was a um, grand ceremonial complex that was only occupied seasonally, um, specifically for celebrating Nowruz or Persian New Year. Next. Next. This is a Shushtar historical hydraulic system, uh, which is a complex irrigation system for the city of Shushtar. Uh, consists of 13 dams, uh, bridges, canals, and structures, and water mills. Uh, it was built by a Roman workforce uh, in 3rd century AD on uh, Sasanid uh, era. And uh, this is the most Eastern Roman dam. Thank you, next. Agabam uh, or Bam Citadel um, is located in the city of Bam uh, in Kerman pr province in um, Southeast of Iran. Um, this is the largest adobe um, building in the world. The entire building was a large fortress and uh, trace back to Achaemenid Empire, 6th century BC. Uh, unfortunately, I, uh, in 2003, uh, a part of it was destroyed by an, an earthquake, and, um, but still a large part of it is remaining. Next. 
Uh, from climate point of view, we can uh, divide Iran to uh, four major categories, hot and dry, dry, uh, cold and mountainous, uh, hot and humid, cool and humid. Uh, as you can see uh, in the picture, um, the vast area is extra arid and almost uninhabitable. Uh, in fact, in Lut uh, Desert, which is uh, right in the middle of the white section of the uh, map, um, um, uh, it was uh, the, um, recorded as the highest maximum temperature ever measured, which is 159 Fahrenheit. Next, please. Uh, uh, in the climatic responsive architecture in hot and uh, dry parts of Iran, as in this picture in city of Yaz, um, both in urban context and in building, um, um, building typology, dealing with um, arid situation is by um, controlled by middle courtyards and more uh, introvert solutions in architecture and urban design. Um, in uh, specifically in water reservoirs, as you can see in the bottom left, um, um, the temperature controlled by wind towers, while in, in the um, bottom uh, right picture, uh, ice pits, um, the temperature, cold temperature captured in the uh, very deep pit. Um, and the, the material uh, of the building is usually uh, adobe or brick, which has a high uh, um, potential uh, for uh, capturing the um, temperature. Uh, next, please. In cool and humid uh, areas, such as north of uh, uh, Iran and the coast of Caspian Sea, which is actually a lake, and uh, in fact, the largest inland body of water in the world. Um, as you can see, uh, urban context uh, as well as building typology is completely extrovert and um, controls humidity uh, uh, with um, various means of uh, natural ventilation. Thank you, next. Uh, in cold and um, mountainous areas, um, we have settlements as these two um, ancient important villages in Iran, uh, which formed by natural slope of mountain. Um, in Kandavan village uh, at the bottom, um, you can see a um, man-made cliff dwelling excavated inside volcanic uh, rocks with small openings uh, and this way, it, with this way they managed to deal with severe cold of the winter. Next, please. Um, in hot and humid uh, parts of uh, Iran, which is mostly located in per uh, Persian Gulf Coast, um, like the city of Boucher here, um, the living spaces are mostly at a higher level to benefit from breeze. And as you can see, the, um, the height of wind towers are less than the central parts of Iran, according to the cool breeze. Uh, that comes from uh, both. Thank you. Next um, um, slide, we thought that uh, for covering the introduction of Ira Iranian architecture, it's worth mentioning uh, to the, the com contemporary architecture of Iran and the fact that it's been um, um, you know, flourishing um, mostly recently after it um, sort of declined uh, and because of revolution and war. And uh, here you can see a couple of uh, project, projects that is um, that are mentioned in um, international competition and, and media. Um, ter uh, Terma office um, commercial building um, and Bar Barin ski resort and a Majera resident in Hormones in, in, and also apartment number one in Mahalad. And the, um, the picture at the right, uh, um, which is a, um, in Tehran and has um, spinning rooms. Thank you, Nix. Um, 
In the following presentation, we will cover um, Isfahan urban design, uh, mainly uh, focusing on um, Naqsh Jahan Square, and also we'll, we'll talk about bazaar and bridges as well. In the um, next presentation, uh, Shazde Mohan Garden, uh, Persian Garden, and also Canada's will be uh, um, touched about. And uh, in the Bruger Viha House, um, as a um, um, good example of a Persian house, um, the um, um, courthouse and also wind tower would be um, more explained. And uh, at the at the very end, Tehran with history and memory and experience will be shared with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rizal. Um Next, we have Isfahan coming up uh, by Cheyenne. Uh, for our audience, if you have any questions, please type in the chat box, and we'll have a Q and A section at the end of the presentations. Thank you, Shibay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shayan Kodusi, a Master of Architecture student at WAC. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, Isfahan, Iran. So Isfahan is located on the main north, southern, east, west routes crossing Iran and uh, was once one of the largest cities in the world. Uh, it flourished from 1050 to 1722, uh, particularly in the 16th and 17th century uh, under the Safavid dynasty. Uh, when it became the capital of Persia for the second time in its history. Um, even today, uh, the city returns much of its uh, past glory. It is famous for the Persian Islamic architecture uh, with many beautiful boulevards, uh, covered bridges, um, palaces, mosques, and uh, minarets. Um, the city includes 15 area or districts uh, at the north and, uh, and south of the river, which uh, separated the city. And uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, Jibar neighborhood, uh, which is one of the oldest area of the city. Um, Jibar neighborhood is uh, located in District 3 of Isfahan, which includes a broad area of the city center. Um, historical part of uh, Isfahan, that large part of it, it's, uh, is located in District 3, including the oldest uh, and most valuable fabrics and monuments of uh, Isfahan city, which have a unique composition, especially in this neighborhood. Um, the characteristic of um, this neighborhood is very important and valuable, especially because of its position and the main axis of uh, historical structure of Isfahan urban core. Um, the city's more uh, splendid time um, began in 1598 uh, when Shah Abbas the Great, between the years 1587 um, to 1629, decided to make it uh, his capital and rebuilt it into one of the largest cities of the world. Uh, it seems that he has had a strong personal liking for Isfahan, and he may have uh, felt that to move uh, to his uh, favorite city would give him his best opportunity uh, for building his ideal capital. Uh, gradually, royal urban planners uh, under Shah Abbas cr uh, created the new heart of the city uh, to the south of the old uh, city center and opened a space uh, called Naqshijan Square between the older Saljuk city uh, and the river called Zayanderut. The essential structure of Isfahan um, in the Safavid period can be described by two major axes of development. Um, first, the north-south axis alongside the old backbone of the city, uh, which was formed, uh, formed alongside the main chain of the bazaar and extended through Charbok Avenue uh, to the south of the river. And second, uh, the east-west axis alongside the river and its artificial branches uh, or Mahdi's. Uh, whereas the first axis of development shaped uh, the built environment in Isfahan, the second axis provided the national um, uh, elements and its uh, influence on urban life. And uh, uh, here's the historical painting of Isfahan looking uh, to the south side of the river where there were other king's gardens by the mountains. Um, so Safavid designer, uh, designers built Charbagh Street as a major new city's a city axis. Charbagh used to connect new and old section of the city um, this city has been designed as the axis of Esfahan Garden City. Therefore, it was formed according to geometrical order and pre-design map. 
And unlike most of the old street uh, in the old Esfahan, this avenue was wide, straight boulevard with two rows of large trees and a stream in the middle. Um, this boulevard was created in, uh, as a north-south extension of the old city, continuing the south, where an extensive uh, complex of Safavid Gardens uh, was created. Um, and uh, also the glorious bridge of Siosepol, or uh, Three Bridge, uh, across the Zion the River, was used to connect Charbok on the, uh, to the south of the river. Um, this one city is uh, famous for uh, the squares and bazaars, which were uh, created in 11th and 17th century. This one has several strengths. Uh, the strengths related to sectors include, uh, include the location of the city, tourism, heritage, bazaar, and commerce activity, traditional arts, and architecture. And uh, it, it includes a um, um, market center and bazaar for small towns and other cities, and also uniquely beautiful cultural heritage in the whole of uh, Isfahan city. Um, the Jami Mosque of Isfahan has always played the role of a uh, center for religious, cultural, and social activities in Isfahan. Uh, during the reign of uh, several past dynasties. Uh, even the selection of Isfahan as the government base of Iran during the Safavid rule, uh, followed by the construction of the new Friday mosque, just off a new city square, uh, and the distancing of the government base from the old Friday mosque, its prestige could not be decreased at all. Um, therefore, it still keeps its religious and cultural power uh, in the heart of the people, and uh, due to popularity, as well as uh, its traditional administration by local people, uh, this mosque uh, enjoys quite a specific cultural, social, and religious value. Um, the role of bazaars is, uh, in Iranian city is very important as well. Uh, this one is a historical city that has a, a particular role in Iran's history, whose bazaar was formed over the centuries. Uh, it reveals the bazaar's uh, role as an institutor and integration factor in the different periods of Iranian history. Um, during the Safavid era, this bazaar was one of the main luxurious trading center uh, in the region. Under it was built in 1620 in the middle of the Nakhchivan Square, the second biggest square in the world. So Nakhchivan Square is the main tourist spot um, of Isfahan and one of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, this square is the first place to see while visiting Esfahan and it is full of tourists all, all over the year. Um, Nakhshi Jahan in Farsi means the image of the world and uh, I'm going to explain this square in more detail later on. And uh, Charbok means uh, four gardens and uh, refer to two perpendicular paths uh, that create four square gardens. Um, Charbo's structure and design were a notable example of Persian gardens, including green areas, pavilion, and um, irrigation system. This street was constructed between 1597 and 1616 uh, during the reign of Shah Abbas the Great. Uh, Charbo was um, the most famous boulevard in not only Aswan, but also in all of Iran. Also, um, Siosepol Bridge, which means 33 bridge or bridge of 33 arches, uh, is another important element that connects the north side of the city to the south side. Uh, construction of the uh, bridge began in uh, 1599 and ended 1602. And uh, these are other images from Charbel Avenue, which is a car food reward since a couple of years ago. And uh, it is more pedestrian friendly with lots of small and big businesses. Um, also, two palaces that are located at the east side of the Charbok Avenue. The um, first one is Chehel Sutun Palace or 40 Column Palace, which was built by Shah Abbas II um, for his entertainment and receptions. Um, in this palace, Shah Abbas would receive ambassadors uh, either on the terrace or in one of the stately reception halls. Um, also, Hashbish Palace uh, or Eight Paradises Palace. Um, located in the center of the garden, uh, built under Shah Suleiman Safavi some 20 years after Chelsea from Palace. It is quite different in style um, from the earlier pavilion, although it um, exhibits the same concern for the interplay of interior and exterior spaces. 
and also other architectural elements like the uh, Art University of Isfahan, which is still one of the most famous school of architecture in Iran, and uh, Charbak Theological School and uh, Isfahan Central Library. Um, Aposi Hotel is another important element alongside the Charbak Avenue, which is the oldest hotel in Iran. This um, 300 years old mansion is one of the greatest architectural phenomena of Isfahan. Um, Abbasi Karban Sarai was built in 1695 under the command of uh, King Sultan Hussein in uh, Safavid uh, dynasty. Um, so, as I mentioned before, Nasr Jahan Square is the main tourist spot of Isfahan. Um, Nasr Jahan Square is 525 feet wide uh, by 1,840 feet long, which, is, uh, which results in a total area of 966,000 square foot. Um, it is surrounded by a two-story rows of shops uh, reflect, reflecting the architectural style of the Safavid era. During the day, um, the square was a play, place for a tray full of seller's tents. On the evenings, um, when the sounds of bargain vanish, the square turns into an entertainment site with jugglers, acrobats, dervishes, and curious citizens. Um, other events such as Nowruz or Persian New Year or Polo matches um, were also held on the square. And again, uh, here's the historical photo of the Nasr Jahan Square as well. So Nasr Jahan Square was built between 1598 and uh, 1629 by the decision of Shah Abbas Safavid uh, when he decided to move the capital of the Persian Empire from Kasvin uh, to Esfahan as a more secure and uh, convenient place. Um, the square is surrounded by structures of uh, different purposes and architecture. And together with the main bazaar of Esfahan, they comprise the huge complex to explore. So on the west side of Naqsh Jahan stands the entrance to the royal residential of Safavid era. Um, Ali Rapu uh, was a place of multiple functions. Uh, on one hand, it was the place, um, um, it was a place in which royal hospitalities were held. On the other hand, it was the place for which the king observed games of polo and other activities in the square held on Nasr Jahan. The building has multiple halls in different floors, uh, all of which have uh, their own unique functions. For example, the hospitalities uh, took place on the sixth floor. Therefore, this floor has the largest rooms. The architecture of the sixth floor was precisely designed so that um, music could have the best effect possible. And that is why this floor goes by the name of the music room. And also overall, the design and architecture of Alivaku make it a great example of satellite architecture. Um, also, Shah Mosque is located on the southern side of Naqsh Jahan and was built between 1611 and 1629. And uh, when you visit Shah Mosque, you will see that there are two passageways that are different in length. Um, the master architect of the building designed this uh, so that the mosque would be on the right axis with Qibla or the direction of Mecca. Um, Sheikh Lutfullah is, is uh, the other mosque in Naqsh Jahan complex. It is much smaller in size than the Shah Mosque. Um, Sheikh Lutfullah was a mosque that was specially designed and built for the women of the harem. Uh, in other words, it was a private mosque, whereas the Shah Mosque uh, was the public one. And uh, due to its private function, it is um, uh, in, in the central Isfahan Square, this mosque does not have any minarets and its exterior is not designed in a majestic way. And uh, also the uh, Beysari Gate uh, and the uh, Grand Bazaar stands at the northern side of the square. Um, the 6,560 feet uh, Beysari Bazaar is one of the longest roofed markets in the world. Uh, it connects the old square of Isfahan to the new squ uh, square, which is Nasr Jahan Square right now. And uh, so each bazaar has had different functions in different cities of Iran so that they vary based on their size, location, and importance. Um, some, of, some of the cities which were located alongside trading routes like Silkway had a great bazaar and the other uh, 
uh, which uh, others which were distanced from those roofs had, uh, had a weaker bazaars. Um, generally, uh, bazaars in Iran um, categorize into three different types. First, periodic bazaar without any architectural space and totally scattered throughout the city intended to be a place for exchanging goods. Um, second, urban bazaar as a popular urban space which accommodated uh, commercial activities along with social and cultural activities of people. And the third one um, is local bazaar, was a smaller type of the uh, urban bazaar with less importance, which was allocated to be a particular area or district of uh, the city uh, or town. Um, bazaars in Islam belong to the urban bazaar category, which covers public passageways, um, which are surrounded by the shops and stores on two sides. Uh, it was therefore a place for shopping, walking, social dialogue, and cultural interaction of people so that it could be uh, deemed as the most important and influential public space in Isfahan and any other Asian city and towns of uh, Iran. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those are beautiful. Um, next, we have Persian Gardens coming out by Mehrani. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mehrane Davari, and uh, I'm a PhD student at Virginia Tech. Today, I'm going to introduce Persian Gardens, and as a case study, I will delve into the Shazde Mahan Garden, or the Garden of uh, Prince Mahan, uh, later after that. Next, please. Uh, these are some pictures that shows uh, the Persian uh, gardens and according to Persian belief, garden was a necessity in ancient Iran and functioned as a place of worship for Mehr and Anahita's followers whose temple in nature were a place that the earth joins the heaven. Persian garden are created to appreciate holy symbols uh, such as water, tree, sky and enclosure. Cultural economic, a political, and some geographical factor have influenced the style and development of gardening in Persia. So uh, in, in old Persia, uh, construction of large, large gardens outside of the city, as well as the inside and the, around the cities was very prevalent. Uh, from the standpoint of architecture, Iran has diverse gardens which are valuable in regard of sustainable design. Uh, Iranian gardens are symbol of heaven or paradise that their geometrical structures make them very distinguished between the other gardens. Since the climate of Iran in some part, especially in the central part, is hot and dry, that result in the lack of water, having a garden was an essential factor to confront this difficulty of the heat and dryness. Uh, as you see in the right picture, that is the water and the four gardens around it. Uh, uh, the water is presented in the original axial structure of Charbak that the Shayan previously introduced or the four, garden, uh, four gardens as the axes are, the, are formed by the central pool, uh, and I will show it in the next slide, and uh, the main waterways, which are subdivided into smaller channel. So this picture just shows that the garden uh, and uh, its most um, features are planting and water. Next, please. Uh, so on the picture right side there is a four garden the concept of four garden and um, that is the basic uh, principle for designing persian garden and uh, basic principle mostly are the use of right angle the uh, division of the garden plot into four uh, right angle sectors, as you see in the picture, role of geometry and symmetry, and the use of wall. The division of a site into four sectors as a symbol of uh, four gardens, opening out uh, in the four cardinal direction through the two main axes, is a symbolic of a creation of Eden. 
as well as the four elements of the sky, earth, water, and plant. So I can relate this to the uh, four elements of Persian garden, including land, water, plant, and space. So I'm going to elaborate a little bit more of each of these elements. The first one is soil. Uh, no, please. Uh, yeah. Because I'm going to talk about the elements. So land is a major element of the garden. And apart from general shape and position, other factors including soil type, slope, and differences in level, feasibility of irrigation, and fertility are also other important issues in related to soil. In relation to water, water is a central element that without it, no life or no garden would exist, would be possible. So water feature include the pool at the intersection of the two axes, waterways, fountains, and channels. In terms of plants, vegetation in Persian gardens uh, consists of trees, bushes, and flowers, and uh, plants are used uh, in a different purpose, uh, such as shading, reduction in the rate of evaporation, and ornamentation. The next one is a space that in Iranian garden, closed space are combined with open spaces. Persian garden focus on, uh, on the main axis that is pathway surrounded by diverse garden. Uh, but mostly um, the layout of garden is rarely completely uh, symmetrical. So geometry serve as a mythical function to reflect the cosmic order of the world like paradise on the earth. Next slide, please. Here I'm uh, going to talk about the type of Persian garden. And most of Persian garden demonstrate the adaptability of the four gardens as the original principle of Persian garden. And this has remained unchanged over more than two millennia. In the next two slides, uh, means that this one and next one, I will talk about the categorization of the Persian garden, which is uh, in several types based on their uh, physical feature. So on the right side, uh, the picture on the top, both on the top in the center and in the left one, left down, you will see the first category that the gardens are located on the flat level. The fin garden, like a fin garden or a around garden that the picture shows. The second uh, is about the, um, uh, the gardens on the, on the steep level that one of them is the picture on the right bottom, Abbasabad garden in Mazandaran, and the other is the one that I'm going to talk about it and it's the Shazde Mahan garden. Next, please. The third category is uh, aquatic garden, like uh, Il Goli in Tabriz, the picture on the right top and the center one. The fourth category is the house garden, the picture on the left, that is the Amir garden. And the last one is the garden located aside the river, the picture on the right bottom, Chelsea to Esfahan. Next slide, please. So as a case study, I will talk about the Shaz de Mahan garden or the garden of Prince Mahan. That is the existing uh, world cultural heritage and its name is Shaz de Mahan. It's an excellent example in Persian garden in designing the garden. Shaz de Mahan was constructed in 19th uh, century uh, in a very traditional manner and it has a terraced pool. The upper end of the garden consists of two residential complexes, while the lower end is the entrance gate. The space between the lower and the upper end, as you see in the picture, is this decorated with water fountains that follows the natural inclination of the ground. Next. Uh, this is a map of Iran. Uh, and uh, this is a map of world that I'm uh, highlighting Iran in that. And you can see that the Kerman, that the Shaz de Mahan uh, is located in Kerman. And um, the Shaz de Mahan garden is around four miles away from Kerman. And Kerman is located in the southeast of Iran, near the altitude of Jupar. 
It has been constructed in Qajar era and fertile soil, sufficient sun sunshine, gentle wind, and access to the water are its beneficial factor. Next, please. Uh, here is the um, bird eye view of the Shah Zemahan. And as you see, it's surrounded by totally a desert. So how it survived with, uh, with so how it's very greenery space while everything surrounded is, is very, uh, is a desert. Next one, please. And this shows that also that how it survived. And I'm going to talk about the water and its irrigation center and how it works. Next one. The garden is placed on steep levels, as the picture shows, and the natural uh, slope divided the garden into the upper and lower path parts. The water starts from the upper side and irrigate all the pl uh, plants as it flows downward. In total, there are eight levels of path that the water goes through. Next. Uh, so how, he, how it irrigates uh, between the desert. As we talk, water enters the garden at the upper side and the stream runs through the terrace shaped pools of the garden. The Shah Mohan garden consists of water fountains flowing to the lower end from the upper end of the uh, garden and um, the fountains, as the picture on the right shows, are not just aesthetically pleasing, but they are constructed to uh, utilize the gravity to help the water flow. The garden's two main pools in the upper side and the entrance have some fountains that carry the water into a very considerable uh, uh, height. Next. Um, so how does the water bring to this desert? Um, Persian uses the Qanab technique as a supply, uh, as a water supply to take advantage of uh, Earth's gravity. The vital resource of Shaz the Garden is a stream originating from adjacent mountains. Tayagran, Qanab, originating from Jupar altitude, is a water supply for this garden. Next. So what is Ghanat? Ghanat is an ancient Middle Eastern irrigation technique in which a long tunnel is dug into arid land. This is a system for transporting water from uh, water wells to the surface through an underground aqueduct. Next, please. And uh, you can see here that it's an underground tunnel and the water is um, um, flowing on that, and so, so one picture is a bird eye view of what's happening uh, on these wells. So, um, uh, this underground tunnel conduct water from uh, melted mountain snow for thousands of miles to the settlement and release their water into the garden pool. Next, please. This is a section trend that's exactly show what's happening in the um, concept of Qanat. And uh, as we discussed, Qanat allows water to be transported over long distance in arid or semi-arid climates without loss of much of the water to evaporation. As the picture shows, Qanat is constructed as a series of well-like vertical shaft connected by a sloping tunnel. This taps into the underground water and deliver it to the surface by gravity without the need for pumping. So then it then after that, it distributed by channels to the architectural land. The vertical shaft along the underground channel are for maintenance purpose. Next, please. Uh, here are some other picture as the, uh, the lower the lower picture on the left side shows that the mountain is on the left and then there are some wells are digged and on the right side is the village. So, um, and the upper picture are the section of the Ghanat. And I need to mention that Ghanat does not, pro uh, Ghanat provides a necessary drinking water and it also helps cooling down the indoor temperature. Next, please. Uh, here is a bird eye view of the Ghanat. 
and the rails. Next, please. So about the architecture, uh, the polar serves as a residential unit also. Apart from the residential area at the upper end, the garden consists of the two-story building at the lower end in which the second floor was utilized as a living area and a place for welcoming visitors. There are other smaller utility rooms along the garden side and uh, each of them has an entrance to the garden. Uh, and in the lower level, the, the picture on the bottom left, you can see the wall around the garden that this is necessary component to ensure the protection of the plants and flower beds from the wind and dust. They also limit two different existed dimensions. Uh, and the right picture is about the plan and its section. Next, please. This is uh, elevation sections and plan of this building. And uh, the main building is situated in the highest part of the garden as we talk. And uh, it's center on its main axis. Uh, it consists of central pavilion on both sides by two wings and layout and its layout and um, elevation are somewhat, uh, somewhat baroque in nature in character. There are two other buildings in the enclosure. The first one is the residential building that is simpler and is smaller with a central structure and two wings. And the second is a house uh, that's in the southern section of the garden that probably the usage is for the domination of the animals. And next. This is a hand sketch by me, by myself, that uh, from this um, garden. And um, thanks for listening. Thank you. That was really impressive. Um, here's the sources for you. And next we have Goner talking about Kashan. Hello, everyone. My name is Golnar Ahmadi. I'm a PhD student at Wacker School. Today, I want to talk about city of Kashan and specifically a traditional house in Kashan, uh, which is environmental. Uh, so you can see some architectural elements and environmental sustainability um, elements in this house. Um, the traditional architectures of Iran have been formed as a result of thousand years of evolution according to environmental conditions as well as the inhabitants styles and also the culture. The culture is and it was and right now nowadays is very important in Iran. One of the distinctive features of this traditional architecture is the organization of spaces and the relationship between the spaces with each other. Traditional architecture is an appropriate response to the factors which may affect the user's life. Um, Kashan is a city in the central part of Iran and it belongs to the province of Isfahan. Uh, earlier, Shayan um, has talked about Isfahan and Isfahan um, is so close to Kashan. So the climate of central region of Iran is hot, arid climate and this region represents a hot and dry area with a high temperature change between day and night sometimes. Uh, there's a difference um, almost 40 degrees um, between day and night. Um, next, please. The neighboring deserts and also the salt lakes, as well as uh, scanty rain rainfall, give uh, the city a dry climate. Um, Kashan has a 3000 year long history with a numerous historical residential buildings and a large number of traditional architectures. Um, climatic specifications have made it necessary to adopt a particular architectural style and urban schemes. As Arzu earlier explained about map of Iran and the climate in Iran, you can see here's the map of Iran and you can see that um, the north and northwest of Iran um, have um, dry and um, cold weather 
And as you go further towards south and southeast, you can see that the weather is going to change to hot and humid. And in the middle of Iran, uh, which the city of Kashan is located almost in the middle of Iran, you can see that um, it, its um, climate is kind of dry and hot. Um, Topography is one of the main issues that define the architecture of the hot Arad region in Iran. In city of Kashan, houses are located according to the slope of a hill of the city and the buildings are all oriented um, to the southeast. Um, courtyards um, are always in the ground floor and have distinct forms depending on the landscape of house. Um, this space sometimes lay out in lower surface from alley or street where to access to them one should go downstairs for more than six, eight steps. In Kashan, nearly all buildings are semi-introvert and architectural features facing in rather than out. As I've told you that um, because, because of Islamic culture and is Islamic um, you know, approach for designing, they would rather to um, design a building which are facing in rather than out. Uh, rooms are usually arranged around the courtyard in such semi-open space as the E1 had an important uh, role in joined um, closed spaces. You can see E1 in the middle of this picture. So the, the E1 is a vaulted hall or a space walled on three sides with one end entirely open. So typically um, E1s open onto a central courtyard. So another way for the control of hot regions is design the courtyard as more compact and of less size. So the architectural elements of designing um, interior courtyard, pool and trees around of courtyard uh, help this building um, direction in, in summer time, which the weather is so hot and dry. Um, before talking about traditional house um, and the case study, I want to just generally talking about some architectural elements which are very important in traditional houses in Iran. So um, one of these architectural elements is Yazdi Bandi decoration. The houses in Kashan are decorated in many different ways, but one of the most used way is Yazdi Bandi decoration. In terms of Iranian architecture, Yazdi Bandi is a specific decoration of dome and it has many elegant and miniature arches within bigger arch. So, and Mahtabi is another, um, you know, I can say architectural kind of um, atmosphere or um, slash element. You can see in the middle of dome, there is an opening toward sky that Mahtabi in Persian means um, where the moon lights or when you can see the um, effect of moon. And they believe that um, exactly under um, this opening in the middle of this space, you can see the face of God. And for that reason, the light and colors are playing a crucial role in architectural, in traditional architectures and traditional houses. And as I've told you, light is one of the unique aspects of Iranian architecture and elements of divine wisdom. Um, also, they believe that light is the God's face. Color is created from the multiplicity of light and has the essence of unity. And you can see how those um, um, tiny and uh, small architectural elements and architecture are all joined in the middle as uh, defining um, a, an opening toward the sky. So another architectural element in houses is Orusi and Panjdari. Orusi uh, is a door which is designed by geometrical shape 
with wooden frame and colored glasses, which are mostly located in five door rooms, panjdari. Panjdari means five door rooms. Panj means five and dari means doors. These windows most often connected to a large balcony with broad looking on the interior courtyard. The glass and timber doors catch the free heat of sun to be stored again in the great brick walls. Why? To keep the family warm at night. As I told you, at the night, so the temperature reduced and um, in, during the day it's increased. So the function of um, this Orosi windows, I wanna talk about the function and what, what is the um, effect of those windows. So um, the windows allow the view of the outer space, reducing the power of radiation and let heat of the sun, give beauty to the building's facade, protect the intimacy of private spaces and remove annoying insects. Walls and roofs of the building in a hot and humid climate, hot and humid or hot and dry climate are painted with light color where it will play the best role in absorbing sun's rays and radiation. Of course, that um, the amount of heat the, inter the internal space of a building takes in depends largely on thermophysical features of layers. So as I've explained earlier that the colors and lights are playing a crucial role, not only for um, visually, I mean, this, um, visually effect of this architecture, but also as an um, environmental sustainability. And um, light colors are painted on exter external surfaces of surfaces of a building also plays an effective role to decrease the daily level of temperature caused by reflected sun's radiation. <coughs> Next, please. Next, please. So I'm going to talk about a case study in Kashan City, Brugerdia House, which is uh, a traditional house and was used in four season in the central part with hot arid climate of Iran. The house was built about 130 years ago and now it is a while that the house is used as a cultural heritage office in Kashan. So this building is um, an example of traditional house and it's very popular uh, and, his, um, and the architect is Ali Maryam. So um, like the other hot arid climates, um, the city has cold winter and hot and dry summers with dusty winds from the desert on the eastern side of the city. Next, please. So the house has only one opening to the outside of the house and that opening is the entrance door and all the other openings open onto the central courtyard. As I've told you, the privacy is what is so important in Persian culture and also Islamic culture. For that reason, as you can see in this diagram, the path to the building entrance and the entrance is located far from the main space of the building. So in order to enter the house, one has to pass through the entrance door, a circular lobby and a long corridor then uh, reaching to the courtyard. Burjardia house is divided into two parts, the winter living part on the north and the summer living part on the south. This building has a ground floor and also a basement and this basement is usually used during the summertime, especially in the afternoons, since at that time, the basement is cooler than the ground floor and also the other parts of the building. The material mostly um, is brick, which can be easily reused for new construction. And the external surface of the building is covered with exposed brick and also the interior is covered with plaster. And um, also when there is a wind, uh, it's taken inside through the wind towers. You can see the wind tower in the picture uh, of porch E1 faces toward wind tower. Uh, when there is no wind, 
Towers act as flues providing vertical ve ventilation as a result of the chimney effect. By this way, the building is kept cool in summertime. Next, please. <clears throat> so in this floor plans, um, I highlighted the winter quarter and the summer quarter. So um, in winter quarter, um, gets the direct sunlight and heat. So the northern part is warmer than the other side of the building. At summer, the residents live in the southern part uh, or the summer quarter because this part is always in shade and it's cooler than the other part of the house. So, and also in basement, some traditional buildings were designed by large basement. The air was channeled all the way down to the elaborate function rooms built in the basement. So, and because of a lack of water in Kashan and also the desert area, they keep water in the basement and by using wind tower, they keep water fresh, cold and clean. Next, please. So this is the section of this house. You can see wind towers and air traps uh, on both sides, left and right. And as you can see that in summer quarter uh, in the basement, they keep water in the basement and through wind towers and making um, air circulation in this building, they keep the water cold, fresh and clean. Next, please. The arch roof always uh, generates wind and reduces the heat, which the roof has accumulated due to sewer sun radiation. Most of the time, the residents uh, would like to sleep on the roof because uh, during the night, the weather is better. In the summertime, uh, during night, they can have fresh um, you know, air um, at the night. Next, please. So, and the other architectural element in traditional houses is air trap. Air trap is a specific feature of architecture in majority of hot regions of Iran. It were normally in a suitable location where wind is blowing from a specific location. So the air trap is open at one direction and closed from the other three directions in the house according to the size of the building. So, and the air trap in ancient time was functioned like a present um, model of air conditioning system that right now we have in modern architecture. Um, air trap is like a chimney whose end is in the underground and the top is set over a specific height on the roof. And at the upper outlet, many small openers or docks are set. And at the end of the air trap, at the bottom of the door, Often a pond is set um, whose water was provided by Kanat. Uh, Mehrone explained about Kanat earlier. And the height of the surface of the cross sections, the number of openers and the location of air traps are different in different buildings and also different part of Kashan and uh, hot regions area. Next, please. Wind catchers. Um, I want to talk about another and the most uh, important architectural element, wind tower, wind ca catcher, and in Persian we call it bod gear. Wind catchers are other elements to the hot climate which were used to ventilate the buildings. So wind catchers are uh, structures built onto the roofs of the building with open units at their head facing in direction of the cooler um, prevailing winds. Um, each face of the bot gear opens into a separate air shaft which leads right down to the lowest level of the house. The slightest air movement in any direction is caught by the tower's opening and is funneled around docks uh, which run behind the walls. It usually is water pond as I've explained you earlier, um, be, uh, the water pond under the docks for helping humidity and cool the air coming from Bodgir. The plan of Bodgir may take different shapes, but the square plan is the most common used one. The Bodgir is divided by two partitions placed diagonally ac across each other down the left of the Bodgir's shaft. And the Bodgir wind tower can also be used in pairs or four on the roof of buildings. In addition to its role as a ventilation device, the Bodgir is usually used as a decorative element, some in buildings and hot regions in Iran. The external <clears throat> 
and internal parts of a wind tower cool down at night, respectively due to heat radiation of external surface of the wind tower and circulation of cool ambient air through the wind tower and building. The coolness is stored in the building mass and, uh, and the stored energy provides thermal comfort on the following day. day. Warm air passing through the wind tower is cooled before entering the building during the day. So, and also the air passes over a moisture surface in some buildings and causes evaporative cooling. Inside the building is cooled by the wind towel until the temperature of its surface becomes greater than that of ambient air due to sun radiation. The wind tower func functions as a ventilator and AC system that right now we use in our modern building and modern architecture. Thank you everyone for your kind attention. Great. So last but not least, we have Nagar. Good afternoon, everyone. Shibe, could you please play the video for us? Yé qui boude, yé qui na boude. Il y avait quelqu'un, il n'y avait personne. Once upon a time, it says. Uh, next slide, please. Tehran, through the lens of memory, a rapid transformation of a metropolis. Next slide. Tehran has been one of the most strategic cities in Iran for many centuries. It gained tremendous power after being selected as the capital city in the 18th century. Next slide, please. The original settlement of Tehran dates back over 7,000 years. In examining Tehran's historical growth, there are several key points to note. Within the boundaries of modern day Tehran, now absorbed by it, is an ancient city of Ray, which you can see in the next slide. This location was of great commercial importance as a trading force since it was situated on the Silk Road. However, it was reduced to ruins after the Mongol invasion in the 13th century. The surrounding area was later fortified, forming the center of what we now know as the modern city. Next slide, please. In 1776, under Qajar King, the city officially became the capital of Iran in an effort to centralize power in the north of the country away from the traditional capitals in Esfahan and Shiraz. This dream of power changed the character of its original community, which was primarily agrarian. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Nowadays, however, the way that Tehran is encountered city life has profoundly changed, becoming an industrialized urban sprawl with little connection to the natural world, except for the mountains that still dominate the skyline. Thus, despite its immense size and high population density, I would argue that Tehran is a city full of emptiness. This emptiness, which is the product of modernity and individualism, permeates one of Asia's fastest growing cities, which is now emerging as a metropolis facing ecological limitations. The contrast between poor and rich, south and north, desert and mountain, plays a significant role in how Tehran is viewed and experienced. Tehran reveals different aspects of itself to those who study it and those who walk in it. Thus, the perspectives and landmarks that are experienced by an inhabitant can vary widely from neighborhood to neighborhood. Next slide, please. Similar to other cities in Iran, the layout of the city was based upon three main elements. The bazaar, the royal palace, and Jame Mosque. These represented commerce, the state, and religion, respectively. The bazaar, built on ruins of silk roads, shaped the heart and backbone of the city. It started from the southern gate of Tehran and continued to west side. Other less important businesses and trade markets clustered around the bazaar, which was connected to residential areas by secondary streets and avenues. Next slide, please. Tehran's traditional street system was based upon pedestrian movement in line with society and technology of the era. However, it later transformed to a modern street system that accommodated motorization. 
This change occurred during the rule of Reza Shah in the early 20th century. This modern street pattern gradually evolved into the open matrix system present today, similar to many, North um, similar to many major North American cities. Next slide, please. In 1921, Reza Shah moved his royal residence from downtown to the north part of Tehran. With this shift, the previously rural northern districts started to be associated with higher and richer social status. During this period, the longest street in Tehran was built, connecting the north to the older commercial center around the bazaar. Named after the ruling family, Pahlavi Street was occupied by many local businesses and continues to be the most well-known street in Iran, now called Valley Astr. Next is Reza Shah adopted architectural and city planning methods used in places like Paris in an imitation of the supposed imperial glory of rulers like Napoleon. These changes are of great importance when analyzing the development of Tehran as the capital of what was proclaimed and presented as the Persian Empire. These styles were continued by Muhammad Reza Shah, son of Reza Shah, though with more caution. Political, economical, and social change continued to accelerate drawing foreign investment and furthering growth. Not only did the street patterns change, but the construction industry and architectural styles also altered accordingly. They changed from low-rise inward-looking courtyard houses to high-rise outward-looking buildings, which illustrate the change in lifestyle and social patterns. Next slide, please. Between the late 19th century and 90 AD, the city grew 25, 25 times larger in area, from 20 square kilometers to over 500 square kilometers. Its rapid expansion led to the rise of its population from half a million in 1940 to 8.6 million in 2016. Even the 1979 revolution did not slow the city's growth. Tehran continued to become larger. The city spread both east and west, as well as expanding into previously unbuilt green spaces within the northern part of the city. Tehran grew to have satellite towns, industrial zones, and suburbs. Despite its irregular shape, Tehran is still growing and currently holds more than 15 million people. Today, many parts of Tehran look like other globalized cities with skyscrapers, cold concrete, and glass and steel facades. Next slide, please. For some, Tehran is defined by, by its landmarks such as Freedom Square or lately Milad Tower and Poletabiad Nature Bridge. For others, it starts with its famous market, the still active bazaar, and for others, it is framed by the Alborz Mountains as the city backdrop. However, however, alongside the continuing changes of power, the city remains an evident manifestation of political forces. This presentation tries to answer the following question by taking the reader through the history, memories, hidden yet important aspects of Tehran. What happens to people's memory and their sense of belonging to a place when the built environment is radically transformed? How did this transformation change our perception of Tehran as a city to inhabit? What social and cultural factors have been altered as a result of these developments? Rather than try to answer these unanswerable questions, as the people of Tehran have been doing for so long already and continue to try to answer every day, these following snapshots of the city focus on human agency through the stories they tell. So for example, in the first snapshots, you can see um, how Tehran has evolved through the time of the Iran-Iraq war. People say that autumn comes abruptly. One day you wake up and see outside through the window that there is a battle between the wind and the colorful leaves in the air. This is how the war came, one morning all at once on September 23rd, 1980. Reading Lolita in Tehran, a memoir by Iranian author and professor Azar Nafisi recalls the suddenness of the war and how this sudden force influenced everyone's life as well as the city's destiny. Shortly after the Iran-Iraq war was first broadcast on the radio, the city soon became empty. As so many families lost relatives to the war, to the bombing, so many places became voids too, sites of loss. Please go to the uh, previous slide. Being irrelevant, as Nafisi declares, is to become light and fictional that can be erased easily by just one quick swipe. 
the way that fountains in the old houses fade away and colorful windows which were open to the yards became irrelevant. Madanipur in 1998 in his manuscript called Tehran, the making of a metropolis argues the Islamic revolution occurred as a reaction to the severe combination of political, economical, and cultural polarization, demanding a share in decision-making, a better distribution of wealth, and the right not to be alienated in their own cultural sphere. He then continues, the outcome of almost two decades of revolutionary rule, however, has not offered a remedy for these ills. During this period, the silence of the majority who could not express what they wish represent the indifference to the imposed demands of the time. Next slide, please. The very first image right behind my eye is the unknown sidewalks with old trees that walk you through, unknown as I vaguely remember the names of their street and places. Tall old trees leaning back against an old wall or coming out of the asphalt amazed me enough to spend some time underneath their atmosphere. The smell of those rainy days of Tehran when the trees shed their leaves like a colorful shadow on the ground murmurs and induces reverie. The memory of a walk, the memory of walking, getting lost in the narrow alleys that once used to be full of vast gardens, and now one may find only a trace of those old gardens behind the walls of each house. There are only a few leftovers of those gardens. Next slide, please. The possibility of dwelling evolves in the Nietzsche of the house, the courtyard. In those inwardly growing gardens, there is the need to find pleasure in rustic surroundings, to build and escape from urban chaos to the silence of a garden, to hear in trees branches the sound of the changing season. The courtyard, the heart of the house, and more than an open space within the building has several elements that were complementary to its existence. Two main elements, the tree and water, act as harbinger of every traditional house in Tehran. A courtyard was supposed to connect nature to people with its water and fruit trees. The gathering of life happens in bringing nature into the solid structure of the building. Urban seclusion in Tehran would embrace ponds in the courtyard along with the wooden beds and of course a teapot with its sound of a boiling, the sound of life. In this rustic package, Taking care of garden, reading poems, mostly hafiz, and enjoying a cup of tea encompass the exact ritual of Iranian inhabiting the landscape. Tea brings about the desire for rustic simplicity and evoking many stories that need to be told. Next slide, please. A hidden treasure in Iran, especially in Tehran, is Ganat. There are underground tunnels flushing millions of cubic liters of water under cities. Tehran doesn't get many days of rain and Ganats were built to provide water to Tehranis and save them from severe drought, which is likely in cities with a climate similar to Tehran. Walking on the streets of Tehran, one can be certain that he or she is walking above history. Construction and modern life have changed the lives of Ganats, yet they are like blood veins of Tehran with a dry climate. Gardens that populate Tehran were relying on them significantly. Next slide, please. Despite uh, being despite being dotted with a tall pattern and uh, okay, you are seeing the hills right now. The snapshot revealing hills, city under the sunset with its unique flavor. In, res in restricted colors reveal another dimension of itself, standing on top of a hill right at the beginning of the darkness. Tehran is getting ready to wear its gleaming colorful dress, borrowing the stars to shine like a jewel out of the ruins. The city's ambient voice blare noises arise from the distance. Each night Tehran tells its story in its shimmering silence, wind and dancing leaves, the celebration between the earth and the sky. Here, blowing sound into the air revives the memories of the past. These few minutes before the sunset took all the colors from what defines all the contrast between old and new, between poor and rich. And in this neutral light, we feel fluency, a feeling of a, refu of a refuge for an escape. And last slide, please. 
Despite being dotted by tall apartments and skyscrapers, Tehran's sky is still saved its dazzle. If you join hundreds of people hiking Tehran's mountain Tochal, you start your journey to becoming mesmerized by its beauty. At night, an endless blanket of light and stars wraps everything within the city. When you reach the first station of Tochal, you inevitably admit the beauty of Tehran a bright gem shining in front of your eyes. Under its vastness sky, it seems without border. Thank you very much. Thank you. I learned so much from our presentations today. Thank you all. And we do have a question from our audience. I'm gonna read it to you now. What lessons can we learn from the architecture of Iran and the, and the West? And aside from its beauty, what elements can Western architecture take away from Eastern architecture? Any taker? Um, I can start uh, trying to answer that. Uh, thank you very much, Moni, for that question. Um, I would say because of the scarcity of uh, you know sources, specifically water in uh, in Iran, uh, in at least most part of uh, Iran. Um, I think vernacular architectural strategies in, uh, in Iran can help us to acquire strategies regarding global warming and uh, the problem of uh, environmental problem we are facing right now at the moment. So um, maybe uh, to be more specific, material preferences, for example, or the size and arrangement of the, the you know, the, the openings in the uh, facades and, and also the, uh, you know, um, um, using uh, wind towers or air traps uh, techniques uh, for, for more natural ventilation uh, than, uh, you know, um, using the, the current technological ones. And also the um, deep underground spaces for um, as it natural refrigerators, uh, as we see um, in most part of the arid uh, climate in Iran, or um, to be um, a little bit more, um, you know, general, to creating micro um, climates within uh, architecture, maybe that is um, that could be um, worth. Um, mentioning and worth uh, looking at in Iranian architecture and uh, and also considering people specifically about uh, the private life of people in architecture which is something that we in in western architecture um, don't bother that much with uh, usually and it's um, becoming a little bit um, um, something of scarce to have uh, that much private uh, space uh, to yourself in a in an architectural, uh, at least residential architectural uh, buildings, and uh, to be um, to close. Uh, I think uh, maybe the most important uh, lesson is to um, avoid uh, futility, and also um, to have some sort of uh, frugality to throughout uh, your um, architectural lenses. Thank you. Great. Um, I can totally relate to uh, the conflict between modern traditionals and how we can bond them to the, together. Um, we have a tourist related question, which I think is very specific, but um, if you have one piece of advice for uh, a new tourist to Iran, what would you give? Um, Any taker? Uh, I think I have a very good idea of Isfahan after Sharyan's presentation. I know exactly where to visit. <laughs> I would say that um, all parts of Iran has some historical place for the visitor to see. They can enjoy Isfahan, Shiraz, north of Iran, south of Iran. All part of Iran has something to say and they are very welcome if you, they are very welcome if they go there. Okay, if, if, I may, 
I would like to add uh, to that, um, to Darren's um, question that uh, um, according to, um, um, you know, our, our rule um, in any, any other uh, country, you can uh, um, have, um, ask for, you know, apply for a tourist visa in Iran right now. Yes, as, as an American. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a follow-up question from Manny. Is there a way to accept the vitality and relevance of Iranian traditional architecture without accepting the constraint and conflict of tradition? Um, what's the constraint and conflict of tradition? Let's start with that. Um, uh, I think um, Mani uh, is referring to uh, specifically theological, theological, you know, constraints uh, that we used to have mo more than today's, and uh, that is exactly what's happening right now, Mani, and and um, you know uh, the um, current. Um, contemporary architecture of Iran is actually dealing exactly this, 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 this thing that you are mentioning to uh, have the uh, you know relevance of uh, traditional um, uh, acceptance of um, you know uh, architecture of Iran and at the same time or tr traditional architecture of Iran at the same time um, um, you know uh, applying it to the modern life of uh, Iranians so so I think this is what ha what's happening and it's a, a constant uh, regard in their um, you know Iranian architecture mind uh, at the moment and as I showed you the contemporary architecture of Iran uh, the ones that I showed you and they were all uh, prize winners were, were all somehow um, consider vernacular still uh, and, and and also uh, you know ecological and and uh, climate uh, considering architecture but at the same time and using the traditional you know aspects of our uh, of Iranian architecture at the same time, um, um, applying it to um, you know modern way of life of Iranians. Great. Anyone else? What's your thought about Iranian architecture going modern? Golnar, do you think the wind tower can be applied to modern architecture? Um, or some a different version of that. I'm personally very interested in high performance passive system, and I think wind tower or wind catcher can be implemented into modern architecture very well. So it depends on from which perspective you you're gonna um, you know scrutinize this function. And in my case of study, you can see that the wind tower. Uh, has been used for um, a building, for one building, for a function of one building. I mean, if you have a residential with building with 20 uh, stories or for the high rise, definitely we cannot use wind tower because the function of wind tower is the way that the wind tower circulate the air through all the spaces. Uh, from, you know, from basement toward the courtyard. And as you can see in traditional house, all of architectural elements are working together. I mean, the wind tower cannot be used without looking at, uh, I mean, without using courtyard, pool, basement, trees, and also, um, you know, um, the height of roof and ceiling, all of our architectural elements are working together as a package, as a, you know, as a result for this building. We cannot just pick one of them and use just one architectural element in one modern architecture. I think the history behind of that and the circulation and the relationship between all of those elements can, um, you know, present this wind tower as a great function, as a passive function. It's not just copy paste. It's not just, you know, using one element for modern architecture. These are all our function spaces, elements are working together. Great, great, great answer. Thank you. Um, 
Besides from the technical aspect, which is the wind tower, I wonder if you all can comment on the aesthetic of the traditional Iranian architecture because visually, it jump off and is astounding to someone from my background and probably from some of our audience. What do you think of that elaborating、uh, visual effect from a traditional Iranian architecture and how that? Translate into a modern language. Is it a difficult question?、Um, actually, I didn't understand your question. Are you talking about beauty of this element, or yes, yes, exactly. So actually,、uh, at the beginning of designing Wind Tower, it wasn't built because of the beauty or the element or working as a monumental architectural element. But since over the time, as many architects use this element for all the houses and for all、um, hot regions, it became a monumental element. It became a, a you know, a symbol of hot area. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. If I may、um, continue on that.、Uh... Uh, about the aesthetic aspects of、um, arch Iranian architecture or traditional Iranian architecture as a whole,、uh, we have to、uh, keep it in mind that there is, a, some, you know, a reason that、um, the use of pictures is not that much,、uh, um, you know,、um, uh, combined with、uh, architectural. Uh, ornaments in in、uh, traditional architecture of Iran, and that that's、um, a theological has a theological、uh, you know、um, theological、uh, reason.、Uh, in Islam, it was it was forbidden to show、uh, face, and that's the, why most of the orna ornamentation in Iranian culture、um, and Iranian visual、uh, you know art culture、uh, was focused on、uh, geometry. Because geometrical or ornamentation was okay, but、uh, um, you know any kind of、um, you know ornamentation that is somehow relates to human body was considered forbidden. So that's why you see so many you know、uh, ornamentations with the、um, a variety of colors and and but mostly in geometrical patterns.、Um, That, that's a side note. I, th I think it's worth mentioning. Thank you. Thank you. And, and yes, I need to mention that、uh, in terms of beauty,、uh, Persian now now what's happening in the contemporary architecture is that we combine modern architecture with the postmodern. Means that.、Uh, The traditional architecture, in terms of ornamentation, translate itself via the postmodern that mentions less is more and the. I see. Lastly,、uh, I'd like to ask you to share something about your recent study in your PhD program or MR program. Is there something that you'd like to share with our audience today, briefly about your own study? Which apologies to my friends. I will start <laughs> from my uh, no own, uh, you know,、uh, research. Uh, actually, my research is about、uh, the interdisciplinary area between philosophy and architecture、uh, concerning environment. So,、um, my goal is to reach、uh, to mostly to questions, actually more than answers, about uh, um, you know our,、um, architectural response to prob you know problematic、uh, environmental issues. Like um, um, you know sustainability、um, in architecture, but、um, I'm trying to look into sustainable architecture through a critical lens、um, by this、uh, you know interdisciplinary area that I、uh, explained. Thank you, Golner. Oh, she already left.、Uh, Nagar. 
So my area of research um, is about um, architectural representation and how atmospheric drawings um, convey meaning and convey uh, something regarding to sensation and uh, emotion. And I'm doing that by examining uh, one of the French, uh, one of the 18th century French architect, Etienne Louis Boulet. Um, and um, I have learned a lot and um, um, maybe it's uh, for another session to discuss this in depth, uh, but um, I would say that I really uh, appreciate your time and thank you for coordinating this wonderful uh, presentations and seminar. Thank you. Uh, we we'll definitely see if we can do another panel. Um, so I know we're running close to the hour uh, 1.30. Um, uh, if we have the chance to do another panel, I'll see all of you uh, next time with ADU's uh, events. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shiba. Thank you, and thank you everyone for attending. Have a great day. <laughs>